Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us for the Regulator Selection and Performance Webinar. Uh, today, we're going to have Ben Carr be with us, but there's a few minor things that I wanted to go over before the, the Ben takes over. So we will be recording today's webinar. Uh, when you've joined, your microphone should be muted uh, throughout the presentation. However, at the very bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box that you can uh, ask your question there. And Rhonda Pugh is our Director of Communications and she will be our moderator. And so she will be interrupting Ben or asking those questions throughout the presentation. Um, there will be an opportunity for live presentation as well uh, at the end. And a follow-up email is gonna be sent tomorrow with a short survey just to review our our webinar and uh, we will also be presenting another webinar in July and the topic is going to be grab today's presentation is led by Ben Carr uh, Ben worked as an account manager for Swage Lock Georgia from 1996 to 2012 to and returned as a regional field engineer in July of 2018 in the 16 years between roles at Swage Lock Ben was the director of the STEM Academy at the local high school and taught AP Physics, CAD, and a variety of other math classes. Since his return, Ben has served our customers by providing technical support, product selection, field evaluation services, and custom solutions. Please join me in welcoming Ben Carr. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, again, my name is Ben Carr. I'm a re regional field engineer for Swage Lock, Georgia, Jacksonville, and South Carolina. Thank you for joining us. And um, we'll spend about 35 minutes probably going through the presentation. I'm trying not to do death by PowerPoint, give you a good basic overview of regulators. And, um, and then we'll leave about 10 minutes for questions. But feel free to use the Q&A anytime during this presentation. I'll pause and try to get to questions uh, as we go through the uh, presentation. So with that, we're going to look at two main types of regulators. There are others, but uh, we'll look at two different ones uh, in this presentation. One is a pressure reducing regulator. That's probably the one you're most familiar with. They are the most commonly used in industry. And then we'll take a, a small look at back pressure regulators as well. Um, the distinguishing features of those, uh, pressure reducing regulator is used to take high pressure and reduce it to a controlled pressure for your process. Whereas a back pressure regulator is designed to take your process system, your upstream process pressure, and control that by bending it out to atmosphere or some other captured part of your system. Um, it's important to note, and we'll discuss this a little bit more later, that back pressure regulators should not be used as relief valves. Um, they are not designed for that function. Their orifice is relatively small and uh, are not really a safety device that would, you would want to use there. So uh, let's dive into a little bit more of how regulators work and then we'll discuss some of the common issues that you might see with regulators. So for pressure reducing regulators, we basically can break this down into two key uh, parts of the system. Uh, one is the control element that consists of the seat and the poppet, as you can see labeled on the diagram there. Um, and they work together to, uh, to control the size of the orifice or, or kind of an automatic valve as the gases flow through and it tries to equalize the pressures. Uh, then we have the load and sensing element, which is going to be our diaphragm and our loading spring that will actually control our outlet pressure. So regulators work off a balance of forces. So we have the spring force or loading force that is pushing downward. We have our inlet spring force, which is the uh, spring on the poppet to help it close as the pressure meets uh, our setting. We have our outlet pressure force which is the upward force across the whole diaphragm on the, from the outlet side of the regulator here. And then we have our inlet pressure force, which is working over a much smaller area than the uh, outlet pressure force. And again, all of these forces uh, 
that are acting upward balance out the downward force of the loading uh, force of the spring in this case. So we can kind of write a, a brief equation like uh, Victoria said, I taught AP physics, so I like these kind of equations. Some of the forces equals um, zero if we're talking about a static situation, but in this case, the loading force equals the inlet spring force, the outlet pressure force, and the inlet pressure force. So if we turn our handle on our regulator clockwise or tighten it down, um, as we do that, we compress this spring. And as we compress that spring, we're increasing the loading force. So if F1 rises, the, the loading force rises, our inlet spring force is gonna be pretty constant. And for the case we're looking at here, our inlet pressure force is gonna be pretty constant. So to maintain that balance, the only thing that can change is our outlet pressure force. So as we increase the loading force, we increase the outlet pressure force. And that's the basics of how a regulator would work. So as you turn your handle down, you get more outlet pressure force and vice versa. If I were to turn my handle back the counterclockwise direction, my loading force would reduce and my outlet pressure would reduce, assuming this is not a static system. And we can look at that uh, or we can uh, spend some time on that later. Uh, here I have a diagram of a pressure, uh, back pressure regulator. So again, it's similar in design to our pressure reducing regulator, but you'll notice our inlet pressure acts over the entire diaphragm. And we'll look at that a little bit closer. Our loading element is still, in this case, a spring. Our seat is initially closed. And if our inlet pressure is less than our loading spring force, it's gonna remain closed. And once that pressure increases, it will open a little bit and relieve some of that pressure. Um, and it, it, the upstream pressure is just controlled by that amount of movement of the diaphragm. So if we look at our balance of forces for our back pressure regulator, we have our spring force or our loading force once again. We have our inlet pressure force. Again, it's acting over the entire diaphragm. So when we talk about pounds per square inch, we've given it more area to act across to counteract that spring. We've removed the poppet in this case. There is no poppet. We just have an O-ring seal there at the seat. So there's no inlet spring force, but we may have an outlet pressure force. Um, a lot of times this is just vented to atmosphere, but you may tie it back into your system. So there may be some kind of pressure uh, working in the opposite direction. So if we look at our balance of forces equation, once again, we've got our loading force is equal to our inlet pressure force and our outlet pressure force. So if our inlet pressure force increases, then uh, that would open to open the regulator and allow some of that uh, system fluid to vent. So some common uh, regulator behavior um, uh, terms that we might use. Uh, I don't want to say issues because they are common to every uh, regulator. We can work to reduce them as much as possible, but you're going to see this with any type of regulator you use from any vendor. So um, lockup lock up occurs when flow is reduced as the regulator tries to shut off you'll see an increase in pressure. Droop, uh, I'll spend the most time on because that is one of the areas where we get a lot of questions. Um, droop is uh, due to the flow increasing, the regulator does not maintain the set pressure. Uh, choked flow happens when we get near the capacity of the regulator and it really isn't regulating pressure anymore. Creep is due to often trash in the system, um, the inability of a regulator to be a great shutoff device, um, and we'll look a little closer at that. 
Uh, supply pressure effect happens as our supply pressure decreases often on a gas cylinder, we'll see a change in pressure on our output and then accumulation, which is essentially droop for back pressure regulators. So we'll take a look at each of those in detail. Any questions before I move on? Okay, well, I'll assume from uh, no, no uh, questions there and we can, again, use the Q&A as we go. So if you have any, please feel free to input them. So what we're looking at here is a basic flow curve. We'll use this to discuss some of the terms. Um, we've removed all the units and, and some of the other complications that come with real flow curves just to simplify this down so we can take a look at each of these. So we have flow along the bottom. Flow is increasing as we move from left to right and then our outlet pressure on the vertical axis where we are increasing pressure as we move upward. So we're gonna first talk about lockup. That's that region right there at the left-hand side of the graph where you see that steep uptick of uh, pressure. So as flow decreases when we shut off the regulator, it needs a little bit of help to close the seat. And while that is occurring, you will see a rise in your pressure. So let's say we shut off this downstream valve and the flow is going to zero through the regulator, we will see that rise in pressure. And it needs that inlet pressure force to kind of help seat it. Again, they're not great shutoff devices. Uh, they're not designed for that. In this case, we see the flow for this particular, flow curve for this particular regulator, and we can see approximately a uh, five to 10 PSI lockup range. So that's gonna be a, a increase in pressure on our pressure gauge. And it has a few effects. Uh, you, if you have very sensitive equipment downstream, you could risk damaging that. Um, secondly, uh, depending on if you set your pressure while there's no flow, we may see a different characteristic and we'll look at that more as we look at droop. The easiest way to prevent lockup is use an upstream isolation valve. Shut off with an actual valve. Don't rely on your regulator to shut off, and we'll talk more about that also later. But that prevents any chance of there being uh, this lockup range where you may have an increase in pressure that could potentially damage your system. We address it a couple of different ways inside our regulators as well, uh, provided that uh, we're dealing with the correct pressure ranges. If we size our regulator correctly, we can make sure that uh, we reduce this lockup effect. If it's sized correctly, it'll have the proper seats for the pressure control range we're looking at, and its softer seats will allow it to seal better. Again, I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time on droop. Uh, we looked at lockup, which was the far left range of our graph. Droop is this middle zone. Uh, it is where our regulators want to operate. Um, and it, again, all of these terms are common to all regulators, no matter who the manufacturer is. So let's look at why this occurs. As I click through these next few slides, I want you to watch the spring, the loading element. So as flow increases through the system, the regulator has to open more. And you can see, as we do that, I'll click, I'm gonna go back up and let you see that one more time. You see that the regulator spring is getting longer to open this poppet more to allow more flow through the regulator. And as it opens more, as that spring gets longer, the spring is no longer compressed as much. And since the spring is not compressed as much, then it's not providing as much force and that upsets our balance of forces. So again, if we look at our equation, if we reduce our loading force because that spring has gotten longer, then our outlet pressure force is going to decrease as well. So as again, as that F1 decreases, F3 must also decrease. So that's where we see that droop in the curve, the drop off in pressure as flow increases and the demand on the regulator increases. So 
if you know your system is always going to have a specific flow and you've got a specific pressure in mind, Droop's really not that big a deal to you. But we know in most cases, that's not how your actual system works. You've got a range of flow, different devices using the same system fluid uh, downstream of that regulator. So we've got this range of flow we're dealing with. So if we overlay our uh, flow curve, we can see, okay, we've got this flow curve, all our pressures are underneath that flow curve, it looks like we're pretty good to go. Problem is, when we actually set this, we have to look at the flow curve for our actual setting, so we actually bring it down to our set pressure. And we can see, if we set it here at our minimum flow rate, that when we get to our maximum flow rate, we've lost some pressure. And this may be acceptable depending on how close or how tight the tolerances of your process are. We can address it by trying to set this pressure at our maximum flow rate. But then as flow demand decreases, we'll see an actual increase in pressure. And again, this may be a compromise for your system. It gets pretty bad if we bench test our regulator. So if I bench test my regulator, I got little to no flow, I'm kind of in this lockup range when I set it, then I take it out and I stall it in my system, and suddenly I'm not achieving the pressure I expected, and then as we increase flow, it gets even worse. Um, so we have to be careful when we're bench setting it. We have to factor that flow rate in and maybe set it at a higher point from the bench so that we kind of hit that middle of the range or that compromise. What we'd really like to do though is flatten out that curve, make our flow curve in a way that is much closer to our actual desired pressure. And we can do that a couple of different ways. Um, the, the easiest way, again, is selecting the right regulator. Um, we don't want to just sell you something off the shelf. We're going to ask some questions to help you get the right regulator that gets it as close to your desired pressure throughout the entire uh, flow range that you require. Any questions so far about droop or lockup or anything I've said before? And there's no questions right now. Okay, I will continue. So if we're selecting a regulator, often we have choices about the spring rate. Um, again, that may be by design of the regulator or that may be by um, just choosing the correct range. So here I'm showing a regulator. Uh, it has a high spring rate there on the left, a 400 newton, newtons per millimeter and then a low spring rate of 200 newtons per millimeter on the right. And those are our choices, let's say, for this particular regulator. And um, both of these are zero to 14 bar control range, but different spring choices. So in order to achieve a particular pressure that we want output for the high spring rate, we're looking at 3,200 newtons, we compress the spring eight millimeters. For the low spring rate, to achieve that same 3200 newtons, we have to compress the spring 16 millimeters. So as that regulator opens to meet the flow that we need, and it moves downward 2.5 millimeters, that spring's elongating 2.5 millimeters. So in the case of the high spring rate, we can see that we have a, a change in the loading spring rate of a thousand newtons. We, we reduce the amount it's pushing down by a thousand newtons. And in the low spring rate, because that 2.5 millimeters is a much smaller percentage of its compression, we can see that it only reduces the loading rate by 500 newtons. And what that means, again, that we're getting pretty deep in the details here, but what that means for you on that same zero to 14 bar control range, the droop for the high spring rate is 3.2 bar, whereas the droop for the low spring rate is only 1.6 bar. 
So again, choosing the right regulator, using the flow curves to determine what will best meet your system requirements and make sure that you get the performance you expect from a regulator. Again, if you just call up and order one off the shelf, uh, maybe it's got the high spring rate and it doesn't give you what you want there. So one other way we'll, we can address it, and I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time doing this um, just because of uh, our time limitations on this webinar, is we can remove the spring and use what we call a dome-loaded regulator. And for a dome-loaded regulator, we use a gas or system fluid to be our loading element. And we can control that either with a pilot regulator, sometimes that's controlled by the actual process fluid, and you can see the difference in the two flow curves. Here we have uh, a large amount of droop as we go through the range, and here with the dome-loaded regulator, um, you can see it's much flatter. Now, the dome-loaded regulators are gonna cost you quite a bit more, so you have to take that into consideration. Is controlling or flattening out that flow curve uh, important enough to my process that I'm gonna spend the extra money to do so? All right, that wraps up the droop discussion. Any questions? I think we're still good here. Okay. All right, let's talk about that next term, choked flow. So we looked at lockup on the far left. We looked at droop, our operating range, what we were actually wanting to operate in. And then lock, uh, choked flow, happens at the far right, and that's where we see that steep drop off in the flow curve. And you can see this, this is actually a real um, flow curve from our catalog. It shows uh, multiple different flow curves for different regulators. And you can see that drop off, that choke flow drop off. So what happens there is our flow has increased to the point where our regulator is fully open. It cannot open any more to provide any more flow and uh, the regulator is now acting as a restricting orifice and not controlling your pressure anymore so you will get that steep drop off in pressure you will not get a consistent or reliable output from that and again it's an extreme version of the droop then we do have one question okay it says um so the low spring rate regulator has a flatter curve Yes, it does. Um, and again, as you read these flow cards, we'll get into that a little bit more. You'll, you'll be able to understand or help you select from those. But we're always available to uh, help you select the correct regulator uh, to get your maximized performance. And so if you call us up and we start asking a lot of questions, um, we're trying to, we're, again, trying to get you exactly what you need that will give you the best performance and best output. So again, we wanna operate our regulator in this middle 80, 70 to 80%. We wanna avoid operating in this upper 10 to 15% where we get lockup and we wanna avoid operating in this uh, lower 10 to 15% where we end up with choke flow. The next issue that often uh, occurs is creep. Um, the best way to make sure that you can protect your regulator and prevent creep is use filters. Um, for our gas regulators, we do have filter elements that are in the inlet port, uh, but they are, uh, it, it is always good to have additional filtration in your system prior to uh, your regulator in order to prevent seat damage or trash from getting in the seat. Even if your regulator is perfectly clean, a regulator is not a shutoff device, so you want to make sure uh, that you have another way to shut off your system because creep can occur even through a properly operating regulator. So why is it dangerous? Uh, what potentially could happen? So let's say your operator shuts off this valve that's downstream and it, they go home overnight. So we've got high pressure gas, 3000 PSI on the upstream side of the regulator. We've got low pressure setting of 100 PSI. 
and let's say some trash it's gotten in that regulator seat. So over time, we're gonna see an increase in pressure on the right-hand side of that system. Uh, in the worst case scenario, we could see pressures on the right-hand side as high as 3,000 PSI. And so there's obviously issues where you might damage equipment that's downstream from that, that's not designed to handle 3,000 PSI. And the other issue is when that operator comes in and turns on the system the next morning, that now we have 3,000 PSI at this outlet. Again, that's a worst case scenario, but it is possible. So what can we do to address it? Again, I already mentioned filters, uh, putting a filter upstream. Uh, we can put a relief valve in the system downstream. Let's say you've got your 100 PSI setting, maybe you have a relief valve that's set at 150 PSI. Problem is with that, again, is if it's shut off overnight, let's say it reaches 150 PSI, it pops off and starts blowing out gas. Um, you're gonna be wasting expensive gas until that system is turned back on. And maybe it's not a lot, maybe it's just, you know, every now and then the regulators reset, or sorry, the relief valve is resetting, but it is a consideration. Just like we talked about with lockup, the easiest way to prevent it is a shut off upstream. That might be your cylinder valve, or if this is in a process, uh, line maybe it's an automated valve that shuts off uh, when other equipment shuts down. I have another so, question for you. Okay. Ben. Sure. So, it says how would you choose to regulate pressure in a system where there's a concern of vapor condensing as a solid, like, and I'm going to say this wrong, uh, naphthalene. Yeah. So we do have heated regulators available um, that can, as the regulator or as the system fluid moves across the seat uh, we can add energy to that to prevent that from happening um, and in some cases we also have vaporizing regulators where the opposite may be true you've got a liquid that you want to take to a gas and we add heat to that as well so and i can address that a little bit here at the end as well thank you Okay, supply pressure effect uh, is the last one for pressure reducing regulators that we're going to discuss. Um, this often is con confusing to people, uh, and it is mostly associated with a bottled gas, a cylinder of gas. As your supply pressure or your inlet pressure drops, the outlet, outlet pressure increases, um, and vice versa when your inlet pressure goes up, let's say you've now adjusted your regulator because you saw this increase in pressure as your cylinder dropped, and you put a new bottle on and your inlet pressure is now higher, your outlet pressure will actually drop back down. You, you know, find yourself going back and adjusting the regulator again. So uh, we can address this a couple of different ways and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, the first way really is to size your regulator correctly. Um, it, it will reduce uh, the amount of supply pressure effect to a certain degree. It, it's always going to be there, but it will reduce it to a certain degree. Um, again, we unlike pressure gauges where maybe, let's say you had a 0 to 100 PSI uh, system, you might use a 0 to 200 PSI gauge in order to to have the gauge read in the middle when it's at its highest pressure. With regulators, if we've got a zero to 100 PSI system, we really want to use a zero to 100 PSI regulator as well. Um, get that as close as possible to the operating pressure that you are expecting to use. So here, again, our inlet pressure is going down. So let's take a look at what that does to the balance of forces. So we've got our equation, our spring force, F1 is not changing, we're not adjusting the handle, we're not demanding more flow. Our inlet pressure force, our poppet spring force is not changing. Our outlet pressure is, uh, is in the system as well, but our inlet pressure force is going down. So if we hold the loading force, and our inlet spring force the same, but our 
inlet pressure drops, the only thing that can happen is our uh, outlet pressure must increase to match the flow or match the system to balance it back out. So take a quick look at that in reality. So you've hooked it up to your 3600 PSI cylinder that you got from your local gas supplier. And as we use the cylinder, we reduce our pressure down to 2600 PSI. So we have a difference of 1000 PSI. If this particular regulator has a 1% supply pressure effect, that's going to be 1% of the difference in pressure. So we 3600 minus 2600 gives us the 1000 PSI. 1% 1 of 1000 PSI is 10 PSI. So we'll see an increase on the outlet from 50 PSI to 60 PSI. And, th and that's typical of any uh, regulator that you would find from any manufacturer that, that this increase is going to happen. And sometimes that's acceptable. Uh, maybe you can deal with 10 PSI increase as your bottle pressure goes down or that 1% change. But if we wanna control that, Again, we have a couple of ways we can address it. We can minimize the supply pressure effect of that regulator by sizing it correctly. Um, but we can also, if it's really critical, we can use two regulators. Maybe we have one regulator at our cylinder and we have another regulator downstream at the point of use. So we'll look at this example where we have two regulators, both of them have a 1% supply pressure effect. In this case, we'll decrease the bottle pressure by 2,000 PSI, so from 3,600 PSI down to 1,600 PSI. At 1% 1 of 2,000 is 20 PSI, so we see a 20 PSI increase in this middle pressure gauge reading. So now we're at 520 PSI. So again, as this one decreased, our outlet pressure increased, but like we said, they, they work in opposite directions. So since we had an increase on the inlet of our second regulator, we have a decrease by 1% of the change on our outlet of our second regulator. So 1% of 20 PSI is 0.2 PSI. So we see a 0.2 PSI change overall at our final point of use. Hopefully that all makes sense. I know I dove through a few calculations there, but um, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Are there any questions? I see no new questions at this time. Okay. Uh, here's just a couple of photos. This is a, a high pressure regulator knocking the pressure down uh, to a uh, lower pressure for one of our pilot regulated, uh, or sorry, our pilot piloted dome loaded regulators. Uh, and this again is to reduce that supply pressure effect as we have changes upstream and giving us a nice steady uh, flow out the other end and constant pressure. Uh, this is an example of our KCY regulator. This is actually those two regulators that we were looking at in the previous example in one package. So we have a regulator in the lower half that has an anti-tamper nut so you cannot change that regulator. And then the second regulator on top, so you can have your supply pressure coming in and have minimizing that supply pressure effects. If you've got critical applications, uh, that is one way you can address that without having to add two regulators to your system. All right. And then the last term was back pressure regulator, or for back pressure regulators, it's accumulation. Again, I said it's like droop for your um, back pressure regulator. The regulator is fully opened and it cannot control the flow anymore. So as we look at the flow curve, it's becoming a restricting orifice and we get this choked flow down here at the end again. And we see a pressure increase along the way. All right, 
when we're selecting a regulator, these are the things we're going to look for. Um, and these are the questions we would ask about if you called us and asked us for a particular regulator. First, we're going to ask the function. That's pretty obvious. Do we need pressure reducing or back pressure? Uh, we did talk a, briefly about vaporizing or, or heated regulators. Um, but we also offer differential pre pressure regulators as well as changeover regulators. So first, we're going to ask about the function. We're going to look at the inlet pressure range and make sure we match that up as closely as possible. We want to match our pressure control range as closely as possible. And then also the flow requirements. Really two, three, and four are the most important pieces uh, to make sure we get you a properly sized regulator that's going to work in your system the way you expect. Uh, we also will address system compatibility, uh, making sure the seat materials aren't going to be uh, eaten away by whatever your system fluid may happen to be. And then we'll look at options, anti-tamper nuts, venting options uh, that are available. And then finally, and, and kind of the least important, is the in-connections. Obviously, we have to have an in-connection that can handle the flow requirement, but we can adapt the in-connection to what you need. Uh, we really want to focus in on that two, three, and four flow requirements. It's important to understand bigger is not always better. You want to make sure that we're sizing it as close as possible. And let's take a quick look at the flow curves and we'll wrap up. So here's an actual flow curve from our catalog. This is built off of actual test data. Um, that's why it's uh, shown with different points for, for the same regulator setup. So as we're looking at that, 0 to 250 PSI in the blue lines, you see different pressure settings and how it behaves for each of those pressure settings. We often have to interpolate by shifting those curves down to see if it will meet your system requirements. Um, but we're actually showing two different regulators on this same graph, and that's often the case. So as you read them, again, if you're not used to looking at them, they can be a little confusing. Um, if you take a little bit of time, you, you can figure it out, but we're always available to help you um, select and read these as well. Um, secondly, our inlet pressure is shown on these curves. In this case, it's shown by a letter. So if we're looking at the maximum inlet pressure for 500 PSI, we can see that there are three different curves that match that, the letter J there. Sometimes the uh, flow curve will also just show the pressure in the pressure directly on the graph. Our outlet pressures are shown on the vertical axes. We show it both in PSIG and in bar. That's typical of our flow curves. And then our flow rates for gas in this case, uh, shown as nitrogen in standard cubic feet per minute and standard liters per minute. If you are using a different gas, please be certain to uh, contact us to convert that to match your flow curve. So let's take a quick look at reading one of these. And again, I know I'm going a little bit over. Uh, we have this one where we require an inlet pressure of 1,000 PSI. We want a outlet pressure of 175 PSI and a flow rate of 25 SCFM of nitrogen. So we know we're going to look at the L curves because we have a 1,000 PSI inlet, so that reduces it down to those three curves. We're going to draw a vertical line. Uh, actually, first we're going to make sure A, it matches nitrogen. That's great. We'll draw a vertical line at 25 SCFM, and we'll look at where that passes through each of those curves. If we were to continue this up, you can see we're operating kind of right at the top of the range for this regulator and we might get more extreme droop or even get into that lockup range. We look at this as we come over and read our pressure. We see that, oh, that's about 210 PSI, so we're good. We know we can cover it. And we know that if we look at our 175 PSI for this particular curve, we always want to read the curve that's above our pressure range, not the one below, that we could get as much as approximately 50 uh, SCFM at, and still maintain 175 PSI. 
of course, we'd have to adjust the knob to account for the droop. So again, that's real brief. If you want to learn more about that, please contact us, uh, or we can just help you read these curves. Soy dock offerings, this is just a few. Like I said, we do have the heated regulators as well that's not shown. This, these two top ones are your typical cylinder packages. This would directly mount to the cylinder. It's got a relief valve in it, gauges. This one would wall mount along with the hose. Um, we have a dome-loaded piloted regulator uh, up to about one inch in this case, high pressure regulators, and then uh, process regulators that are also dome loaded and piloted for larger systems. And with that, I'm open for questions. Okay, we have one here. It says, does a dead volume in a regulator degrade the purity of a high purity gas cylinder? Do, I'm sorry, does the what in a regulator? Does the dead volume in a regulator degrade the purity of a high purity gas cylinder? Uh, as long as the regulator was cleaned properly, it, it, the, the volume should not change its purity um, it, unless we were possibly vaporizing it and we had different vapor pressures, uh, say for a cow gas, where you may have some separation. But I don't think it should affect the purity as long as we're uh, not changing phase. Do you have a recommended back pressure regulator set up for solvent borne paints? I would need to get with the factory on that. Uh, we don't publish flow curves for liquid service on back pressure regulators, but I know we do have pressure re regulators that could work in that type of system. Uh, we would definitely want to stay away from some of the O ring materials for those uh, solvents, but um, we should have something that would work. I'd just have to consult the factory for uh, information for that specific application. Very good. And then another one, are there any special considerations for oxygen service? Yes, uh, and we do offer um, oxygen service cleaning um, and obviously the materials that we would use in the regulator uh, would we would want to be uh, selective on that to make sure that we do not introduce uh, combustible materials uh, or at least low ignition point materials in that system. Okay, we have one more. Um, do, you, do flow curves change the system media, gas versus liquid, different liquids, different gases? Yes. So even though our flow curves are shown in um, for nitrogen, uh, we would use a simple specific gravity uh, calculation to convert that, say we were using helium, we would convert that to a standard flow rate of nitrogen uh, to allow us to read the flow curve. Uh, we do have liquid flow curves as well published in the catalog for all our uh, most of our pressure reducing regulators. If there is not a liquid flow curve uh, shown, uh, it may be the case that that is not advisable to use that particular regulator for liquid. Um, we do, the flow curves for liquids are shown as hydraulic fluid, um, but again, we can use a specific gravity conversion to um, be able to convert that to just about any other liquid we need. Okay, we have a couple more here, Ben. It says, how, sure. long can you, how long can you regulate a nitrogen tank down to? And then need to regulate down to two to four PSI. Is this possible to, to do reliably? Um, we do have some uh, low flow, high accuracy uh, regulators that will, uh, we have a zero to two PSI and a zero to 10 PSI range on some of those. Um, sometimes when you get down low in your cylinder, uh, you will lose some quality on your gas. Uh, but yes, you can reliably regulate down generally to uh, a few percentages of your outlet pressure. So let's say you were zero to 10 PSI, uh, you could probably take your cylinder down to uh, probably 100 PSI and still maintain uh, your system fluid. Okay, and one more. We have uh, Mr. Carr. You mentioned an isolation valve upstream up the regulator. What kind of valve do you recommend? So if you're pulling from the cylinder itself, 
you can just use the valve on top of the cylinder. Um, depending on the gas, if you're using oxygen, we want to use a, a slow closing uh, needle type valve that requires multiple turns so we don't shut off high pressure gas, high pressure oxygen uh, quickly. Uh, but for any inert gases or, or liquids, you could use uh, a ball valve to shut that off as long as it's rated to uh, your inlet pressure, maximum inlet pressures. Did you have another one? No, nope, I think we're good. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, please feel free to email us uh, with any other questions. Again, uh, Victoria will be sending out a survey. We'd appreciate you uh, completing that for us. And uh, please reach out to us if you need any help selecting a regulator for your system. Have a great day. Thank you.